Gary Gock, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Dr. Dave, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It, well, it's such a pleasure to have you. And we're going to be discussing your book, Pause, Breathe, Smile, Awakening Mindfulness when Buddhism, when Buddhism is Not Enough. We're going to come back to that subtitle. But let me start out by saying how much I appreciate not only your book's message, but your style of writing. Oh. Uh, I hope you won't be offended, but I would say it's very Zen, if, if I may say so, by which I mean it's pithy and punchy. Uh, there's a lot of thought and discipline behind every sentence. Uh, you avoid cliches, which is really a good trick. Uh, there's a poetic sensibility in your writing that comes through and a lurking humor. Uh, and and much and and even more importantly for me, it's not preachy. Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, have I embarrassed you enough now? <laughs> <laughs> On YouTube, you can see me blush. Okay. I'll and tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Writing the book was partly about that. As a practice of Zen, it was a Zen practice to write. Right. Uh, as Zen, and so I think this is probably the first confirmation. <laughs> you succeeded. You, you succeeded. Shock now, of recognition. Yeah. Now you're a highly disciplined person, and I'm wondering if you were that way before becoming a Buddhist, or is it a consequence uh, of the practice? Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I've learned through my practice how setting aside a certain amount of time for a discipline or a ritual or a, even a ceremony can become muscle memory. And then it gives me more freedom. And the crazy, wild... Um, non-disciplined person is able to function better. <laughs> okay, well, that's a good tip. Resist, resisted at first. So like, I don't want to do these things. I'm a crazy wild child. But I discovered, yeah, this, this is true. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm interested, I'm as much interested in you as in the book. And we'll talk about the book, but I want to start off talking a little bit about you. And uh, I'm interested in... Uh, kind of the history, if you will, of your spiritual path, uh, when you felt called to it, um, you know, give us the, the stepping stones, if you would. Sure. Um, called is the word. Mm -hmm. I was doing an interview when somebody said visitation. When I was eight, I had a vision. Mm. Yeah, and it, I've described it in detail, but in, in a nutshell, um, I saw or even experienced in my seeing um, the what you might call the unimpeded interpenetration of all things. And I was like, wow. Yeah, I well, didn't know what to <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a, what, a Satori experience for an eight-year-old. I don't know if it was Satori, but it was, it was something that I felt in my bones. Yeah. And I, I took it like, um, you know how in a, in a jeans a pocket above the right-hand pocket, there's a little pocket? The watch pocket. Is that it? That's it. I put this like in there like a piece of gold rather than have it get mixed up with mm. everyday, you know, interchanges. Yeah, yeah. So I could, I could kind of go back to it. And uh, two years later, I uh, read a pocket book called The Way of Zen by Alan Watts. Alan Watts, right. <laughs> right. And um, I think it was page 37 that he was talking about uh, the Sanskrit word for and the meaning of the interconnectedness of all things. And I went, whoa, shock of recognition. This is what I experienced. Wow. Not, not anything referential to soul, God, 
creator deity um, eternity any of that stuff it was just yeah. part of the language and vocabulary of buddhism and i said wow when i vibrate with the universe i must be a buddhist <laughs> or, or that it would explain to me better yeah. there was a real shock of recognition it sounds like yeah Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Called is the right word, I think. That really sounds like, you know, Campbell's notion of getting the call. You got the call. What was the next step for you after the call and after the, the uh, confirmation of Alan Watts' book? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, a step between then and finding a teacher was the next step. And in the 50s, you know, there were more Buddhists sitting behind glass cases than, you know, people talking to other people. And so I, I, somebody would come through town like uh, Paul Reps. Yeah. And he was very influential in my practice. I started, Zen you know, there were... Moms, right? Is yeah, the, he, he, he did that with Nyojin Senzaki. Okay. Yeah. Um, there were little blue books you could get for a nickel by mail order. And I got, the, I got two that taught me meditation, and I was doing that. But I was looking for a teacher because sooner or later you want to, you know, have a, a relationship with someone else in doing this. And so long story short. Um, after the various wonderful teachers that I had, um, I read the Thich Nhat, and you know, I tried the Zen Center when Suzuki Roshi came here, um, and I, I visited. When Thich Nhat Hanh came to the United States for the second time, uh, he was giving a public talk, and I went, and like that, I saw my teacher. Sure. Yeah. And bonus, I saw the community because he would have monks and nuns come out on stage first huh. and do kind of a warm up shtick or whatever. And then he'd come on. And at first I was like, what is this? You know, I came to hear Thich Nhat Hanh and I'm seeing monks and nuns until I realized this is who he is. He's a man who's building community and I felt immediate warmth as well as light from him which was very important and so that was the next step was connecting with a, a community how old were you at that point uh, uh, that was about 20 years ago okay and um and really, it, it, my impression is that he... No, had, no, that was... I'm sorry. I'm a bad historian. <laughs> that would have been about 40 years ago. So I was about 30. Gosh. That's, yeah, that sounds more like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can tell you've been at this for a while. And, uh, and you actually went to... Uh, I guess he had a community... You, went, you mentioned in your book or somewhere in your bio that you sent me the the plum community and i, I thought yeah. well i wasn't familiar with it and we may have listeners viewers that are not that familiar with tick not on oh. and i uh, i uh, just did a check in on wikipedia it was surprised to see that he wrote 70 books in english <laughs> 70 books in english and uh, other books in other languages he knew a bunch of languages and so he had this uh, plum community in France. Is that right? Is that where you studied with him? Uh, for you're right. For, for the viewers and community that aren't familiar with him, plumvillage.org, I think it is. Plumvillage, you know, dot org or dot com, is the website where you can find out everything you want to know, and it's called Plum Village. Okay. Uh, in, a, in a small town in France where he'd been in exile um, from uh, Vietnam for his um, 
activism during the American War. And I studied um, with uh, one of his senior teachers. And then he would come to town once a year. So that was sort of how uh, I would, how the connection formed and continued because he was, and still is, he's still alive. Um, I'll tell you an interesting thing. He, one Christmas, he was giving a talk about Dr. King. And he said, because um, they were very close, and he said, um, every time they met, they would talk about one thing every time, and that would be community. Hmm. And yeah, Dr. King was never able to fulfill his dream of building beloved community, uh -huh. uh, the kingdom of God, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, and Thich Nhat Hanh has, you know, a hundred uh, practice centers uh, around the world. Yeah. And has built a community of thousands of people. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. Now, your bio also mentioned that you were ordained by him. And so what does that mean? <laughs> um, so I thought that it would be a ceremony of some uh, words spoken and some maybe a song or a recitation and maybe a piece of paper and um, I'll tell you it was one of the most transformative experiences of my life um to put it there so? well but to, let me just to put it okay. very um plainly so people can get a, a a frame around it um when i say that Thich Nhat Hanh has been building community this is the traditional buddhist fourfold community which is monks nuns lay men and lay women as a community. Okay. And I, um, in becoming officially a Buddhist, I did something called receiving the five precepts. We call them mindfulness trainings. It's a traditional uh, ceremony practically throughout Buddhism. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh has created his own order of Buddhism within Vietnamese Buddhism called um, the Order of Interbeing, or part of the Plum Village Community of Engaged Buddhism. Yes. Is what the full name is. And the Order of Interbeing is the core community, and I was invited after being a member for, you know, a couple decades. <laughs> yeah. Did you become and, a, monk, a monk at any point? No, 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 no. So, no, I didn't. But see, people often it's always ask, you know, well, are you a monk? I said, no, there's monks and nuns, lay men and lay women. So I'm a lay man. Okay. I'm a lay person. In Sanskrit, it's supasika. It of means course. that I live... I, I live, this is how I live now. I live by vow. Yeah. It's completely transformed my motivation for everything from getting up in the morning to everything I do. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. That, I think that, again, that comes through in the writing that's uh, of a piece, you know, that we were talking about before. The, the, I'm interested in the, uh, <laughs> these, that moment of um, ordainment that you talked about that was so so special there was no piece of paper there was no union card <laughs> no special garments was there a ceremony what, what was it oh it is the, there is a ceremony okay um and there is a piece of paper and it's not like a union it's like a library card if you have a library card and you don't use it it's no, it's nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a, a term called transmission in 
various spiritual communities. And in Buddhism, what Thich Nhat, the way Thich Nhat Hanh explains it is, what is transmitted is presence. Right now, I'm feeling a presence of you in my room in our Zoom, <laughs> listening, laughing together, and knowing that I'm present with you in your room as we're sitting here together and we're forming some kind of connection. Mm -hmm. It's intangible. So what gets transmitted is sort of like when, you know, I think it's like when Jesus says, behold the lilies of the field. Yeah. What is he saying? He's, he's showing us a flower. Yeah. And if we see the flower really deeply, really fully, the way Jesus is asking us to, he's transmitting something that you can't put in words. So I, I was, and I, I was on a day of mindfulness yesterday with, I don't know, 40 people. And in the ride home, I was talking with um, someone who's interested in ordaining himself, who I've been kind of mentoring as he's just taken live mindfulness trainings and is kind of officially a Buddhist, you know, is, is, is what you would say. And I would describe to him my ordination ceremony, which I hadn't done in years. It took me about 10 minutes. I could go there if you want. No. <laughs> I, I'm just, it's, but it's it was like, blah, 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 blah. the words just, yeah. I, it, it's, but it, it, I'm, I think what's come out in our conversation is that you said you recognize that in my writing. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm so touched yeah. to know that I'm, yeah. Is confirmation. Yes, definitely. So let's speak about your book a little bit here. <laughs> uh, and you've got a copy of the book there. You showed it to me before. I, I read it on Kindle, mm. you, yeah, digital version. So well, I'll I'm happy to show it because Sounds True, my publisher, did such a wonderful job of uh, designing the outside, uh, let's see, the inside, where do I find something to show the inside? It won an award for, it has sheet music. Um, it's very light and yeah, uh, it's, so it isn't, you know, very heavy, right. literally. Um, so I want to ask you about the book. Um, I'm really intrigued by the book's subtitle, Awakening Mindfulness When Buddhism is Not Enough. Uh, Dr. Dave, you did that the first time. It's when meditation is not enough. It's because you don't have the book in front of you. It's okay. But it, the I, title I, is... I put it wrong in the, in the title of the show. I'll have to go back. When uh, meditation is not... Uh, yeah, that, that clears up my... Uh, <laughs> well, it doesn't totally clear up the question. I'm so glad you caught that, though. I'm just uh, shocked. But I'm getting up there <laughs> in age. I'm making mistakes. And uh, talk about noticing. I'm noticing mistakes. <laughs> and sometimes people help me out by <laughs> calling my attention to it. So let's try this question anyway. By the way, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, it's what the flesh is heir to. Um, awakening mindfulness when meditation is not enough. Yeah. Now that's a strange thing for a long time Buddhist meditator to say. Kind of paradoxical. It's one of those things. Hmm. Um, I mean, when is meditation not enough? How can meditation not be enough? Here's the thing. It, it refers to mindfulness as having become, well, I say awakening mindfulness, see, which could be to awaken our mindfulness or a mindfulness that is an awakening. Awakening mindfulness when meditation is not enough, 
it's referring to how, um, well, you had him as a guest on your show. Ron Purser uh, wrote an, a, a, a viral HuffPo piece with David Loy called Beyond McMindfulness, noting how um, Buddhism has been rebranded as mindfulness and is as such, uh, it has benefits, but as he's noting, also can be denatured, colonized, um, um, instrumentalized, yeah. denatured, and isn't really anymore what it originally was. So what I did with this book, kind of in response to that. Sure. The, you know, the culture, there's something about our culture that um, can co-opt just about anything. It's like a like an amoeba. Uh, I don't know if I've chosen the right small creature, but kind of folding itself around and incorporating, digesting yeah. something that was other. But now it's no longer other. It becomes part of the culture. Yeah. And I've kind of joked about a, a sort of semi, uh, uh, semi joking that it seems like we're in a mindfulness bubble. And um, so, from, and I get that both from what you're saying and from, from what Ron Purser has said and written. And something that caught my attention recently is I was driving through Petaluma and off to the side behind some buildings, I saw a big warehouse and it had a big sign painted on the, the warehouse that said, mindfulness meets mindfulness meets m-e-a-t-s right. uh, man this is really going yeah. Yeah. pretty far now everything is mindful even the products are mindful I remember when that happened with zen i don't know well zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance oh, yes, and yes of course everything I was I like I bubble because are you, I don't know if you're referring to also the stock market, how in the, the stock, stock market. market you have bubbles. Yeah. And of course, the original one had something to do with tulips in Holland. Ooh. Tulip, <laughs> yeah, that was before the, the, uh, the U.S. The, stock market. And somehow everybody got so excited about tulips that their, uh, their value just plummeted. Huh. People had... It, you know, planted tulips like crazy, <laughs> and then the, their value just plummeted. So I was actually curious enough about mindfulness meets to go online and look them up. And um, I think I've got that here. I've lost it. But basically what they were saying is, oh, here it is. I looked them up on Google and it said organic good clean beef <laughs> for our health community and planet organic pasture raised non gmo verified dual purpose and i don't know what the two purposes are dual purpose animal agriculture restoring the health of america's meat market so that all sounds good i mean <laughs> but but yeah hey. we're gonna go Stamp everything mindfulness. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have a rubber stamp. This this has been certified as mindful by Gary Gock. <laughs> no, well, cert and certified is another issue that you know you could go into, uh, possibly of interest to the shrink wrap community, because if you're a psychologist, you're certified. Yeah. Right. And how do you get certification? And what does that mean? And I'm always fascinated, by the way, how Jungians always have to continue doing practice on themselves and get recertified. I think partly their issue I wasn't is to, aware of that. I, I, I Oh, yeah. Know. I think part of their issue is about transference. Transference, that they, mm -hmm. they felt it was important for a therapist to continue practice and get recertified so that 
you know, they weren't transferring onto their, their, their uh, patients. Yeah. I mean, and so that becomes an issue in mindfulness now where you have people certifying people in mindfulness and you can be certified so you can be a mindfulness coach, you know, go to Alco or your local, you know, uh, community corporation or business. And to me, that's, you know, part of this kind of, aspect of it that I find kind of, um, um, you know, not uh, maybe beneficial for some, but I'm a little queasy. Yeah. 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 yeah I can definitely understand that. Mindful meats. And uh, Hey, I'm a, ve- <laughs> I'm a vegetarian. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the mindful meats aren't going to do it for you. Huh? It's like, it's like saying health food. Yeah. Health food? What I mean? How can food not be healthy? But in this case, what they should—I don't know—they might. They should have found a, a better word for and mindful. I mean, was the meat mindful? Well, and clearly, I, they wanted to jump on the bandwagon in a way and use something that was uh, catchy and, uh, you know, I mean, even without going and studying what they had to say about it, I think the message came through to me that it, you know, that they were paying attention to the quality of meat that they were providing to the world. But let's not go too far down down that trail. Okay. Uh, Yeah, one of the questions I had, which I think maybe we've already kind of been addressing here, is going to ask you, what's your reaction to the growing ubiquity of people speaking about mindfulness? Does it make you glad or alarmed? (laughs) Well, so, I mean, back to the so just to uh, un- unpack that a little more. Yeah. Um, you know, like they're apps now. I don't, I don't have a smartphone. I, I wouldn't want to have a smartphone to have an app. If I had a smartphone, I wouldn't want to be on my smartphone even more so that I could use an app. To me, an yeah. app and a smartphone, it, personally, it, it's not part of my experience. But if 10% of the people who are using apps for mindfulness go, hey, this is good. I want to find out more about this. I don't want to just subscribe to apps and get benefits that are like products. I want to deepen my relationship with this or maybe dive deeper. Then it would be great, you know. I think, and I think that's possible. I think it's great. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that's. I, and I can give you, I, I, if I may, I can give you a really good example of how meditation is not enough. Because today, when we say meditation or mindfulness, I think most people think of calm less stress, stress reduction, maybe focus, maybe better relations, um, maybe happiness, but they don't (laughs) associate meditation with an ethical foundation as a practice and philosophical worldview as a practice with which it's integrally involved. So pause, breathe, smile is pausing as intentional relational ethics, breathing as meditation, smile as the, as the catchword for um, a philosophical worldview that might see the unimpeded interpenetration of all things or deep insight into the nature of self. So to sum up a kind of like a takeaway of meditation is not enough. If you think of meditation as just calm, that's not it. It, It's good. Yeah. But it's still not it. The, The full nature of meditation is using calm as a place of stability to then be uh, available to do the insight work. 
yeah. into the nature of self and, and reality. There are a couple of key words there in what you've been saying that we can drill down on a bit. <clears throat> I think I forgot one of them already. No, I, I remember now. The ethical, the ethical component we should dwell on a bit, and um, hmm. the awakening component. The, I recently did an interview with uh, with a, psych, a Harvard psychologist, uh, Sam, not Sam, Dan Brown, who is also a uh, has deeply studied Tibetan Buddhism and is a practitioner of that. And we, after the interview, we started talking about that that a little bit. And uh, somehow the topic of mindfulness may have come up. And he said, mindfulness doesn't go far enough. He, said, he says, what? He, he says, that's just the kind of the first step. You've got to move on to <clears throat> awakening. And I notice awakening is even in the subtitle of, of your book, I think, and certainly goes through it. Is that is that a statement you would agree with too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, and um, and the ethical component. I know that's something that Ron Purser mentioned as well. That in the uh, he's critical of mindfulness having been engulfed by capitalism and and having developed a, a capitalist type uh, instrumental flavor, if you will to get something, to accomplish something, to, et cetera. So talk, uh, give, give us your take on, uh, on the ethical component. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think I used the example in the book of uh, a dog that can, you know, dog is in the moment. <laughs> a dog is, is always in the moment. Uh -huh. um, a um, jewel thief uh, being in the moment is in the job description. <laughs> um, and I could kind of, you know, make that a little sharper if I was to bring, like this morning, I was thinking about Jeffrey Epstein. And, you know, maybe he practices mindfulness. If he does, nobody in his mindfulness circle mentioned ethical um, training. So to put it kind of positively, um, our thinking and our, our words and actions, you know, they create our world. Um, everything we do has a, response what we how we see the world is a reflection of our our self and to have a relational at, uh, training training our minds and hearts so that our relationships with ourselves and others and society is based on conscious intention rather than, oh, I'm just meditating here, is part of the practice so that I can um, see in the world a mirror of how I'm doing, of my practice, of what my issues are, of where my breakthroughs are. All that and more <laughs> is to me uh, what ethics is about. And it's not a, if, you know, a abstract philosophical kind of uh, thing in, in, in Greek letters above stone pillars, part of a practice. And it's very, and, you, and to have a mindfulness practice or a meditative practice or a psychological, you know, practice, to be a therapist without having guidelines as to these ethical issues of uh, harm, sexuality, our relationship to things, um, how we speak, um, what we consume, um, you know, that's very important. I, I think of it as having a, an awareness of our responsibility to 
to others, our responsibility to ourselves, our responsibility to others, to our physical environment, to the planet, to keep all of those things as part of what guides us. And that's a practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's a practice. And also yeah. it's, it's a meditative practice because there really is no separation between ourself and the world ecology, other people are different than us. Our environment and ourself are so interconnected that to work on the environment is to start working on your feelings about impermanence, about risk and harm and danger. And to want to transform it is, is just simply like, you know, you could have, think of it as like the Dalai Lama says, it's selfish altruism. Yeah. Right. I don't want to live in a planet where, you know, everything's going to die and everyone's freaking out. Or yeah. if, if, if it's too late, how do we deal with what we have left and the people with whom we come into contact with, mm -hmm. as well as our own sense of this? Yeah. So guidelines for, uh, not just behavior, but for me, it's part of uh, a practice. Yeah, yeah. Now, Thich Nhat Hanh used this phrase, engaged Buddhism, and somehow that's kind of about this, isn't it? Yeah, so he coined the phrase, and it was during the American War, and he wasn't the only person who, for example, wasn't staying inside the monasteries during that war, but was going out in the countryside and doing social work for uh, families, children, um, refugees, because he couldn't not, because that was part of the practice. Yeah. To yeah. ameliorate and, and liberate people from suffering, which is the core of Buddhism. His way of expressing engaged Buddhism, a phrase he's coined, is interesting. He, um, he says it, it's 20, his name, not Han, means one action. Hmm. And he says, mindful, you don't make room for mindfulness. You don't take extra time for mindfulness. It's available as a practice with every opportunity in our everyday lives. Yeah. Right now I'm engaging, we're engaging in a conversation with our full attention in the present moment. And that's engagement. And that same engagement is absolutely necessary vital and potentially healing and transformative if we want to, you know, work in a hospice with other people, if we have a political, social, environmental issue, we want to join others with to bring about change. So see, he's not making a separation between my engagement with myself or my engagement with climate change mm -hmm. to, to this ph philosophy, this engagement is being present to ourselves in the world in every moment. That's very much in contrast to the, uh, to the popular image characterization of meditation as contemplating your navel which, you know, the, the critique behind that is you're not engaging with the world. You're just being very self-centered. It's a classic uh, kind of uh, dialogue that humanity's always had, I think, where some humans, some of our brothers and sisters, some maybe ourselves included, have said, look, I got to get clear myself first. If I ain't clear myself, I'm just going to get more frazzled by the stuff out there that I would like to deal with, 
but I got to get my, you know, stuff together. Yeah. And then I'm going to do it. You know, I can't help but not do it. But at first I got to do this. The other side of the dialogue is um, to take all beings, all creation as the motivation from the get-go mm -hmm. with the realization that I may be imperfect, the world may be imperfect, but we can't entangle the inner and the outer and that to work on a simultaneous um, way of this is um, the way to go. So what you just mentioned is kind of like the image of the meditator who sits on a, it's, it's in every cartoon in the New Yorker, man. It's the guy who sits on top of a mountain on a little crest of a mountain all alone, you know, in a robe. And, you know, some guy in a business suit has climbed up to see him and there's some caption. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that is valid too. You know, there are still monks in the mountains of China that don't know Mao existed. <laughs> so engaged Buddhism, you know, is a phrase that came out during the war in, in um, Vietnam and was true also in Thailand. Um, it, it, you know, since Buddhism is very new to America, it was, it, it came about as a very viable aspect of Buddhism, you know, in the 60s, I'd say, or the 50s or 60s. And Thich Nhat Hanh is not the only um, engaged Buddhist, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, I could think of a lot. But also, I would frame it in terms of um, engaged spirituality. Dr. King, for example. Uh, Dorothy Day, um, uh, Howard Thurman, um, you know, there's Native Americans, um, uh, Hindus, uh, various, you know, spiritual uh, teachers who've uh, modeled engaged spirituality for us in our time. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, mentioning that and those names, for me, uh, it kind of draws a line between the uh, be between organized religion, people who are primarily coming from that framework, and people who are interested in coming from a framework of actual personal experience, some kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And I guess I guess not everybody's called to that. Uh, the the these two different paths, and they both probably have their upsides and downsides. Because as soon as I say one thing, I'm hearing I'm thinking of the opposite, which I'm sure you're familiar with that phenomenon. Oh you know, as, yeah, oh as yeah. Being critical of organized religion, I have to remember that. Well, it's very important to many people. And there are some good things that it's accomplished in people's lives and people's world. So it's hard to paint it all with the same brush. That's yeah, so I think you're, you're, we've gone from engaged spirituality to uh, uh, spiritual but not religious. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is the great open secret of the past 25, 30 years. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I love that phrase. I mean, that's that's the phrase that I identify with. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. That's why it was important to me that you not be preachy. <laughs> because I grew up in uh, with a certain amount of exposure to uh, a, a version of Christianity that uh, I, I got very turned off to, which was preachy. <laughs> But this is not about my pathology here that we're supposed to be It's talking. not a pathology, Dr. <laughs> Dave. Welcome to the club. And it's a conver I I appreciate, you know, we're what, what at midpoint? Kind of how this is a conversation. Yeah, good. This is good. Yeah. 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 Good. So there was part of me that um 
felt that the title of your book, Pause, Breathe, Smile, well, that says it all. <laughs> Maybe it could have been a one-sentence book. The opening of the book is a, like, 50-second meditation. You know, it says, yeah. you know, people ask me, and I say, I, you know, rather than uh, for, you know, people who haven't read the book, it opens like this. Uh, people ask me, you know, what is mindfulness or what do you do? And I say, well, you know, you know, have you heard of a Zen or what mindfulness is? And rather than talk about it, why don't we just do it right now in three breaths? Are you willing? And they, you know, and then in the book, I, I walk a reader through three breaths. Yeah. And then I say, all the rest is commentary. Right. And so the rest of the book is the pause section, the breathe section, the smile section trying not to comment on itself all the time, but just present these, you know, taking a deeper dive into what you experience when you experience like three conscious breaths. You experience something, now what is that? Well, you, you had an intention to do this, so that's ethical. You have to pause before you take a conscious breath. You know, you have 21,000 breaths a day, but they're not all conscious. So there's the conscious part, there's the breath. And I also, you know, let's add a smile while we're breathing. And you notice that when you just smile while you're breathing, you feel happy. Yeah. And why, you know, why wait? <laughs> you know, why, you know, be prejudiced against, be prejudiced against the body if, if we're capable of, you know, uh, a bodily um, joy body mind um if that's the answer what was the question no i don't know yeah <laughs> okay you have a section titled relaxing and gladdening uh -huh. and uh, i like that word gladdening tell us about um that. so i get we're more about you know, when I say the smile is the is the rubric for um, the wisdom tradition of inter of impermanence and non self and interconnection, it also refers to happiness. And um, this is more than um, consumerist happiness. This is a true deep happiness, and I think we need it. I mean, if, on one hand, you know, why do it if you don't enjoy it? You know, why feel dutiful about, you know, trying to attain a better self, uh, such like. But also, um, we're Teflon for um, positive experience. We're Velcro for negative experience. Yeah, right. You know, it's, uh, it's called the caveman theory that we evolved to this point in time that we um, are able to have survived the saber-toothed tiger and the serpent and all these dangers. So we have a um, fight, flight, fright, uh, vasovagal, adrenaline, uh, 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 endoc endocrine, neurolog endocrine neuro neurological system so that we're constantly, you know, uh, fearful or, you know, uh, greedy or kind of in denial about things. And that we need uh, to gladden up <laughs> just to, you know, counterbalance all the human heritage we have. Uh, um, and in my case, also being Jewish, I have to counterbalance all my ancestors suffering for, you know, huh. I don't know, as long as Jewish history seems to yeah. have been around. Um, so, um, gladden, I guess it's a verb. I hadn't really thought of it. You don't say, you say enjoy like it's a verb. It's more like savoring. Gladdening is more like, um, uh, up, it's, an, it's an uplifting uh, suggestion to uh, yeah. gladden up. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I mean meant about your writing and the thoughtfulness that goes into it is that you had to go through that sort of process, I think, to get to that word to find the word that felt right, 
and it wasn't just a cliched way of saying it. Uh, thank and, you. Yeah, and thank you. <laughs> 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 and I think that gladdening also is related to another thing that you write about and that's more in our awareness these days is gratitude. Mm. And uh, in the midst of all the problems of the world, uh, if we look closely, there's just about always something to be grat to feel gratitude about in our lives. And so easy to get caught up in other more peripheral things and to lose touch with that, that core of just being, uh, if nothing else, able to be present to this movie, <laughs> this experience. Yeah. Hmm. I don't talk a lot about gratitude in the book as a topic. It has, I think, a little sub-chapter. But it's also there in the, you know, the meditation section is a very deep um, uh, guided uh, tour of full awareness through focus on breathing. It's called a full awareness of breathing. And one of the phases is uh, uh, being aware this is the present moment. You could sort of think of that on the in-breath, if you like. And this is a wonderful moment. You could say that on an out-breath. Uh, present moment, wonderful moment. And what it um, calls to, to attention, uh, one way to put it is it's the non-toothache meditation. I don't have a toothache? Ah, that's good. What else is going right? Oh, I feel the earth underneath my feet as you and I are talking. That's great. Yeah. I see the light in the room. That's wonderful. I have eyes I can see. Um, and you just sort of think of all the things that you can be grateful for that, that kind of start with very simple, basic, elemental um, facts of life. And I think that gives a link into the, the gladness the natural joie de vivre, yeah. the natural joy of being alive, and that gratitude is that kind of consciousness of it. And that is also part of the generosity of the universe, of our human birth, of our living on this beautiful planet, and that that generosity is something that we likewise want to express reciprocal that to me gratitude and generosity kind of are like twin wings if i'm really grateful i want to give it back or pay it forward or you know yeah. you know pass it along right right yeah, yeah. You've got a, a section called, What is Wisdom? What is wisdom? What I'm, is I'm crawling up to the cave <laughs> on the mountain top, and yeah. there you are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 I hear I, oh, so now I'm Santa Claus, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just read you that section for a minute? Yeah, I've thought Or that part of it? My comment. Well, there's a Chinese word for an active sense of wisdom in which you see um, two characters. There's the heart, which is also the mind, and over it, hands, it's actually three parts. There's the heart mind, there's hands, and they're holding uh, a broom, which is, you know, two tree symbols, it's, it's pictograms. Yeah. And that's the word for wisdom in Ch a word for wisdom in Chinese. And I love it. I use it in that opening section what is wisdom? Because we have a sense of wisdom as an accumulation of knowledge. And you know, he's very learned. He's read a lot of books, but he's got to learn the first things, the the most important things last there you know he hasn't yet learned to tie his shoelaces we you know a wise person sometimes is someone who hasn't read any books but creates this kind of sense of 
having been there and back and, and wants to just, you know, share the essence. And it, 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 so Chinese word, I digress, but I digress. Well, I can digress. The Chinese word is about clearing out the heart, clearing out the mind. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you could say emptying the mind, maybe, or just doing the housework of clearing the mind or, you know, sitting still and letting the mind clear, rather than a sense of accumulating stuff for the mind that we call wisdom. And then that's the case of, you know, Parmenides talking about Socrates said, <laughs> and that's a quote by Hegel, and yeah. it becomes kind of, it's very intellectual and, uh, and uh, uh, thinking, uh, right. overthinking too much. Yeah. So, so the wisdom section, but it, so with that kind of approach, maybe, um, the important thing I think for me about wisdom, whether it's a Chinese word or whether it's Sophia or whatever, is, is that it's about the nature of reality, the reality of uh, who I am, who you are, who we are, self, and the nature of what is the world. And to have a worldview that has a take on that um, is wisdom to me. And, and in the book, uh, the wisdom that's offered are three sort of um, mm, aspects, you, sometimes traditionally known as seals, like a stamp, a seal. Uh -huh. If you notice impermanence, ah, you're noticing the nature of reality. Reality leaves its mark with impermanence. Uh, uh, to, to my morning walk today, I just noticed for the first time a tree across the street, it's dead. And whoa, how poignant it was to see that. Yeah. Have that, you know, visual apperception. Uh, the second one is the interconnectedness of all things, which is kind of it comes from the first if everything's always changing then everything's kind of always interconnected because one thing changes into another nothing stays the same it's always becoming like a cloud becomes rain rain makes rivulets which become rivers that go out to the ocean which evaporate and become a cloud and the third one is non-self or openness these are marks or aspects of um, wisdom as a, 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 an active seeing of the world. And if you like, and if the community would like, if I may, I'd offer that as a practice right now without dead air. You want to try it? Sure. So, okay, here we go. I'm, I'm enjoying, and it's, even though I'm talking while I'm breathing, I'm inviting you through your nostrils, maybe, you know, and have a nice, relaxed posture and breathing in notice your breath coming in and the breath leaving and the next breath just sort of returning and that you can't hang on to it it's always changing you know if you hold your breath too long you know you'll find out where will you find out where it comes from <laughs> i don't think so so enjoying the continual changing from the beginning and end of an in-breath beginning, middle, and end of an out-breath is connecting with impermanence. And with the next out-breath, allow the next out-breath just to fall away from the body, just as far away as to the horizon. And notice a, a pause, a space, and the next breath returns. Don't breathe in the next breath. Just notice that when you breathe out, breath naturally returns and that breathing occurs of its own as this natural in and out with a pause where we're connecting with the world. We're, we're breathing in the world. We're breathing out into the world. This is sort of another way of seeing our interconnection with the world is our breath. 
And as we rest in this um, spacious awareness, we notice that we don't know what the next breath is. <laughs> so we wait for it. It's not the same as the last breath. And it doesn't have a logo. It doesn't have, it doesn't say this is my breath now. It's just, it's the next breath. And that we're not doing it. We notice that the breath sort of comes and goes of its own. It's impermanent, it's interconnected world, and it's, it does it of its own, self, and it's completely, when we do this, we feel open. We feel, you know, sometimes it's described as um, a big sky mind in which the clouds are just, you know, like weather or thoughts, that they come and go. And that that openness, which is also non-self, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the breathing. I'm my breath. I'm the, you know, I'm not this fixed um, personality anymore. So those three um, aspects of wisdom, like the aspects of ethics, are a practice. Right. They're not, you know, they're not something I, you know, take off of a shelf or it's on a website or an app necessarily, although apps and books and, and, and things can, you know, point us towards um, our, our connecting with our personal experience of this. So and thank you for asking. Yeah. Podcasts too. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this podcast, podcast especially. <laughs> yeah, this podcast is winding down oh. and that could be the coda that you just gave us, or is there anything more that you'd like to say as we kind of wind down? Gosh. <sighs> Go slow. Enjoy the roses. Smile to your fellow human beings. Notice when they smile back. Thank you so much. Yeah, Gary Gock, I want to thank you for being my guest today on Shrink Wrap Radio and for sharing this space. <laughs>